Welcome to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we trade in personal finance advice for entertaining conversations about money. And in recording a TV show, I always feel like I'm wearing the same thing over and over again, like a cartoon character. Welcome, welcome world to yet another episode of Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm. I am, of course, your co-host, Ben Carter. I am joined, as always, by my trusty co-host and licensed financial advisor, Mr. Malcolm Etheridge. Malcolm, what is going on, sir? Man, it's cold outside. It's starting to like get that cool. It's legitimately cold outside. <laughs> like my old man football knees are like, you know. They're starting to creak. <laughs> they're more than creaking. Like I just, I'm worried if they're going to support me. That's funny. That's funny. Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, real quick, a couple of housekeeping notes, as they say, in corporate offices before an event starts. Um, as we move into the winter time, because we're getting to that point between fall and winter, mm -hmm. I want to let people know we're going to have a couple of intermittent shows. Sure. There's some life events coming up for, for me. Um, three times the life events coming for you. Three times the life events. And if you're unclear as to what we mean, go back a couple episodes and look for the emoji that has its eyes bugged out. Um, that's the episode you want to listen to. Um, and then uh, also just with the holidays coming up, you know, we, we, we have a couple shows coming up where it'll be a show or, or, or a couple things missing. Uh, but stick with us. We'll get back on it, especially as the new year comes around. Another piece of interesting information, Malcolm, on the podcast side specifically, mm -hmm. we are Manager Damn Money, the show, mm -hmm. at 96,000 downloads. Lifetime. Wow. wow. Yeah. So that many people keep coming back for more. Apparently. Because they can't all just be one-offs. Like some people have to be re-downloading. Yeah. And some of that's probably from folks who are kind enough to hit subscribe. Right. So that they automatically get that download that and contribute to that 96,000. Indeed, indeed. So uh, keep sharing the show. Keep listening to the show and watching the show. We appreciate every bit that helps us uh, move up and more people hearing the show. Uh, as we do on every show, it is now time for headlines. Dun -dun 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 -dun. Uh, millennials are causing the U.S. divorce rate to plummet. This was a, a Bloomberg piece by Ben Steverman uh, in September of 2018. Americans under the age of 45 have found a novel way to rebel against their elders, Malcolm. They're, Go figure. They're staying married. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, new data shows younger couples are approaching relationships very differently from their boomers who married young, divorced, remarried, and so on and so forth. And this is a nice story because it make, it's making millennials sound good We already. finally did something right. Indeed, finally. Um, Generation X, and especially millennials, are being pickier about who they marry, tying the knot at older ages when education, careers, and finances are on track. The result is a U.S. divorce rate that dropped 18% from 2008 to 2016. Oh, that's interesting. That's pretty strong. Yeah, and that was according to an analysis by the University of Maryland uh, sociology professor Philip Cohen. Uh, demographers already knew the divorce rate was falling, even if the average American didn't. Their question, however, was why and what do current trends mean for the marital prospects of today's newlyweds? Uh, one theory, the article reads, is that divorce rates are falling largely because of other demographic changes, especially an aging population. Um, older people are less likely to get divorced, so maybe mellowing boomers were enough to explain the trend. Um, Cohen's analysis of U.S. Census Bureau data survey, however, suggests something more fundamental is at work. Even when he controls for factors such as age, the divorce rate over the same period still dropped by 8%, Malcolm. So, so like, real quick, what do you think that, like, what would you assume a trend in less divorces would be attributed to? Um, well, I think kind of to the, the a point they made in the buildup, mm -hmm. it's waiting a little bit longer right. to make sure that this is actually what you want to do. Right. Um, versus, you know, we've known each other for a year, and right. now it's we're, we're we're at the ripe age of twenty five. It's time to <laughs> time to do this thing. Right. Um, I think now folks are actually like expecting to be in their thirties. So they get married. you know, I'm getting married next year. I'll be in my thirties. My fiance's in her thirties, and mm -hmm. that's kind of normal. Like, right. you know, it's not 
oh my god what's taking you well kind of some people have <laughs> some asked people. me that you have asked me that <laughs> among them um but some people ask that but not everybody right where uh before it was like you know 25 was it like right. if you're not married at 25 you're missing out on the party right and then people realized they went to the party too early realized right they they got there a little too early right and if you have ever been to a party that's any kind of fun before you know if you're there too early it's not as much fun as if you get there fashionably late. That is a hilarious analogy, sir. Look at you. Bravo. Oh, yeah. I, I want to applaud you for that <laughs> one. That was very good. Um, interesting thought. Uh, so we're, this is becoming the norm. Uh, do you think it has anything to do with like our finances in general? That Absolutely. Oh, so you think it has everything to do I with I think, that? well, not even I think. It's been proven a million times okay. that the majority, I don't know what the statistical number is, but right. the majority of divorces stem from financial strain. Ah, so true. arguments, fights about money. Right. What's also happening at the same time is our generation is waiting until they have more of those financial boxes checked right. before they decide that they're willing to then tie themselves to someone else. Right. And also requiring that that someone else have those same or similar financial boxes checked. Mm -hmm. So if you've got that part taken out of the equation, mm -hmm. and that is the thing that's causing so many people to get divorced in the first place, mm -hmm. well, then the probability of you not having a marriage and then divorce right. is a lot higher, I would think. Right. So that's true. I think that and it, it solves itself. Right. It makes me wonder um, whether or not I forgot what I was going to say. So I'm going to just keep reading from the story. Young people get the credit <laughs> for fewer divorces because boomers have continued to divorce at unusually high rates all the way into their 60s and 70s. Who's divorcing at 70? <laughs> like, for real, there's nothing left for you at 70. Like, just go on with her until you're done here on Earth. Um, from 1990 to 2015, according to the Bowling Green's National Center for Family, and marriage research, the divorce rate doubled for people aged 55 to 64. Man, you guys are some screw-ups. And even <laughs> tripled for Americans 65 and older. Um, the professor's results suggested this trend called gray divorce. Oh, my God, gray divorce. I've never heard that one, but I like it. <laughs> gray divorce may have leveled out in the past decade, but boomers are still divorcing at much higher rates than previous generation did at similar ages. And with that, I've remembered my question. Um, I wonder if millennials are just like are like are we making decision based at least primarily or even in part on the kind of lifestyle you just outlined like i paid off my loans like i'm secure in my career is that something that is more of a thing now in this generation and culture than maybe it was before rather than just like for love well <laughs> <laughs> now you're taking us back to our love and money show right it is um and if you haven't heard that show i suggest you go back a few episodes and find it right but anyway so i think yes but also our population is the most educated it's ever been okay so you have a shift where you've got more people who are now college educated mm -hmm. which then means that i delayed getting married and starting a family because i went to college right people have advanced degrees that's an extra two three years right People have PhDs that could take God knows how long. So Forever. now I'm in my mid thirties before I'm even seriously considering taking on anything additional right. in my life. And so as that person chases more education, all those life things get pushed back a few more years. Right. And I think that's probably what we're really seeing. Okay. It's just the the population getting more and more educated, right. which means that means that the population is delaying the Everything life else. stuff in pursuit of more education. That's interesting. That's interesting. Well, uh, for the record, here on Manage Your Damn Money, we just want to clear it up. Boomers and old folks, we're better at staying married than you are. <laughs> Look at that. Um, we want to remind people, you can always catch past episodes of Manage Your Damn Money on Apple Podcasts. You're going to get us so many unfollows. <laughs> SoundCloud, <laughs> Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Um, and please, please, please leave us a review and give us a rating on any of those platforms. It helps more people catch the show. Um, and, of course, if you have a question for Malcolm for his Malcolm's Money Minute, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. He has some really good thoughts on all things money. Um, and, of course, you can always catch us on social media. My handle is at MYDM1. Malcolm, how about you? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And that's on Twitter and on Instagram. And, of course, you can catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash money. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back.
welcome back to manager damn money with ben and malcolm and i neglected on the other side of that music break to preview the conversation at hand for this episode so i'm going to tell you now today's episode is a rather dense one malcolm that i'm really excited about is it time for a new kind of capitalism a booming economy and record low unemployment numbers are our current reality in 2018 but how can an economy be booming at the very same time Americans are suffering from stagnant wages that haven't even kept up with inflation? How can we be seeing record highs in the stock market while regular people still feel the squeeze of their day-to-day -day finances? It could have a lot to do with our system of capitalism. In this episode of Manager Damn Money, we're taking a look at whether or not we need a new kind of capitalism, Malcolm. And this whole show is inspired really by one particular article that we pulled. And one particular person. One particular person uh, who, honestly, when I read it and I read through it, I was like, oh, wow, that's like, these are some unique concepts that I had never thought of before. Um, the headline that we pulled for this particular show, Elizabeth Warren has a plan to save capitalism. Uh, this was an August 2018 piece on Vox.com by Matthew Iglesias. Um, Elizabeth Warren, who is a senator, uh, I can't, what state is she from again? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, right. Um, Elizabeth Warren, she has a big idea that challenges how the Democratic Party thinks about solving the problem of inequality. Um, instead of advocating for expensive new social programs like free college or health care, she's introducing a bill Wednesday called the Accountable Capitalism Act that would redistribute trillions of dollars from rich executives and shareholders to the middle class without costing a dime, and that's what the uh, article read. Um, Warren's plan starts from the premise that corporations that claim the legal rights of personhood should be legally required to accept the moral obligations of personhood. Um, traditionally, she writes, in a companion on an op-ed that was published in the Wall Street Journal, corporations sought to succeed in the marketplace, but they also recognized their obligations to employees, customers, and the community. In recent decades, they stopped in favor of a singular devotion to enriching shareholders, and that's what Warren wants to change. And I think what she's referring to, Malcolm, is the day of the uh, when like Ford and GM, mm -hmm. where they you know paid your salary, and if you were with them for thirty years, they would pay you a pension. You know, they were looking at that time to put money places, and they just gave a lot to their employees. Um, and so what she's referring to is like the capitalism of our grandparents' era, right? Um, so, so the story goes on to say, but a key ingredient is missing to that mix, though. Okay, what's that? Our grandparents' era had labor unions, right? We do not. We do not. Or they exist, but in a very, very, very watered down percentage, right? Versus then, right? So that's the biggest piece that's missing from this whole thing, right? And and and, and a union would, in theory, advocate for its employees right. to not advocate; they would demand right. that their employees have some of these things that she's talking about. Absolutely. Um, the rollout of her bill, which was, uh, like I said, in August of 2018, apparently, the rollout of her bill suggests that as she weighs whether or not to get into the presidential race, she'll focus on how to prioritize workers in the American economic system while leaving businesses as the primary driver of it rather than government, which is, we've always talked about government doing, you know, redistributions of wealth in different kinds of ways through mm -hmm. taxes and whatever else. Um, but this is one that tries to get at it through companies that are at least a at, of a certain size. Uh, now, the details of the proposal are what really make this interesting. So put your thinking cap on because you really got to listen. Uh, <laughs> she's proposing a dramatic step that would ensure workers and not just shareholders get a voice on big strategic dis uh, decisions. Warren hopes that this will spur a greater a, a return to great corporate responsibility and bring back some other aspects of more egalitarian era of American capitalism. And this is like that was like immediately after World War Two, uh, more business investment, more meaningful career ladders for workers, more financial stability and, of course, higher pay. Um, the, 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 the concept of tying together war the concept tying together Warren's ideas is that if corporations are going to have the legal rights of persons, they should be expected to act like decent citizens who uphold their fair share of the social contract and not act like sociopaths whose sole obligation is profit profitability. 
um, as is the current conventional wisdom in American business. As much as I don't like to agree with this, uh, with Elizabeth Warren, it's just like a <laughs> principle for how I live my life. Uh-huh. I have to agree with that one. Okay. Like Citizens United passing through the Supreme Court, right. in short, basically said that corporations are allowed to be treated like people, right. but only for the instance of being able to contribute dollars to political campaigns. Right. Because it furthered their agenda to funnel money to folks like right. Paul Ryan, who <laughs> took the most money from corporations right. in the last election cycle right. and basically just does their bidding for them. Right. So I understand from the perspective of Elizabeth Warren in this case mm-hmm. saying that basically if you are going to be treated like a human person on this in hand, this case, you've got to also be a law-abiding citizen who's worth something on this hand. Right. I can actually completely agree and appreciate that one. Right, right. And uh and and Citizens United if you if not cl- you know familiar with that, look it up. It's it's pretty quick quick to understand if you just google it real quick um warren wants to create an office of the united states corporations inside the department of commerce and require any corporation with revenue over a billion dollars only a few thousand companies meet this mark um to obtain a federal charter of corporate citizenship and this this is the meat and potatoes of the uh situation the charter would tell company directors to consider the interests of all relevant stakeholders meaning shareholders but also customers, employees, and the communities in which the company operates, um, which would be aimed at more broadly shifting American businesses and the culture of businesses um, from focusing first on shareholders and back towards something like the broad ethic of social responsibility that took hold during World War II and continued after several decades. Um, The proposal specifically um, says the United United States corporations will be required to allow their workers to elect 40% 40% of membership of their board of directors, which currently a board of directors is not ch- chosen by a uh, company's workers. Right. Uh, the second provision, limit corporate executives' ability to sell shares of stock that they receive as pay, requiring that such shares be held for at least five years after they were received and at least three years after a share buyback, which essentially allow prevents a, a, a CEO from immediately cashing in mm-hmm. on the share they were given as part of their compensation. Um, and then also require corporate political activity be, to be authorized specifically by both 75% of the shareholders and 75% of its board members, many of whom, again, uh, would be worker representatives under the full bill. So this is like a whole new, like, I again, conceptually, these are some really new thoughts that I had not previously thought of. But myself. not impossible. That's the amazing thing about it. And so I said that in jest initially about how I love to disagree with her, Mm -hmm. but partially in jest because sometimes she has a very Bernie (laughs) Sanders-esque way of saying things that's just so far beyond what's possible that I just stop listening. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I actually do think that a lot of it is, you know, very well thought out out for practicality's sake. Um, I, I do think that, corporate boards should be required to have people on them, not everybody, but people on them who have worked for the company before. Right. Because if I'm coming to your your job, for example, I can't come to your office as an outsider, sit on the board and make decisions for how you're going to do your job every day if I've never sat in your seat and done the job. Right. That's just counterintuitive. Right. So I think it makes sense to have people who have business expertise. Some of them, in some cases, have completely flamed out and failed at running the company they ran, right. but now they're on the board of a successful company telling them how to run theirs. Right. How does that make any sense? Right. So I think you should have worker representatives who have retired from that company after 30 years and know it in and out right. to be able to help add some reality and practicality to it. Right. Um, so I can I can agree somewhat. Now, um, some of this requires you to understand a little bit of the history and the rise of shareholder-focused capitalism. Uh, The conceptual foundations of the current version of American capitalism are found in Milton Friedman's well-titled 1970 New York Times Magazine article, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Profits. That Mm -hmm. was the name of the piece um, in 1970. And in his view, which has since become the dominant perspective in American law and finance, corporate shareholders should be understood to own the company and its executives should be seen as their hired help in maximizing values of shares, Uh, Therefore, executives uh, to set aside shareholder profits in pursuit of some other goal like environmental protection, racial justice, community stability, or simple common decency would be a form of theft as we currently conceive of capitalism now. 
So it's interesting because, like, obviously, you know, we know about the concept of the one percent. Sure. We're talking about a, a shift in what capitalism could be if some kind of version of this bill were turned into law. Um, would that be possible considering the powers that be? How how hard would Wall Street and shareholders fight to ensure that they don't have a board composed of forty percent? of uh, a company's workers. That gets back to the initial issue around Citizens United right. and the fact that Wall Street and those larger corporations you're talking about comprise the largest donors to these political campaigns. Right. So if we were to put a cap on how much you're allowed to contribute to a campaign right. or completely take it away right. and take the money out of it and then you actually have to vote for who's actually a logical right. candidate that you align with their ideologies, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And that would actually be very much possible that folks would vote in people who would make laws that allow them to say to corporations, right. if you are going to have this company that affects the lives of you know, 300,000 employees in some cases as the largest employers in this country have, mm -hmm. you're going to have to actually do these things to improve the lives of 300,000 American citizens. Right. I think that would actually be possible if they weren't so afraid of the big bad wolf that is their largest donors, that is right. Wall Street. It's like a cycle of doom, so to speak, right. where and the people buying your candidacy or your seat in Congress right. are the ones preventing us from actually making some kinds of changes. Um, so it's interesting. It, it, I, I do, though, reflect on kind of the capitalism of a, a day gone by mm -hmm. and what we have now. Are there any things in your mind that come to mind when you think of like the pension days for our grandparents versus where we are as millennials? Well, I think something that's kind of exploded since then in a, I don't want to say, the capitalist in me does not want to say in a bad way, mm -hmm. but I can see the reasons that it is bad. CEO pay. Right. Like the average CEO in the 70s made something like $5 million. They had access to a few fringe benefits here and there. Right. And that was it. They got paid in company stock. That company stock appreciated over time. And they're probably gajillionaires now where their beneficiaries are. Right. Where now a CEO can make hundreds of millions of dollars in a year, right. even if the company does terribly. Right. So your employees didn't get paid an extra dollar. Right. Your shareholders didn't get returned an extra dollar. Right. But you got paid hundreds of millions of dollars for failing at your job. And graduated into the 1%. That should be fixed. Right. I don't know if it's because you put a cap on it or you put stronger clawbacks in it to say, if you have a bad year, we're taking back what we gave you in January, right. or what it is. But I also think that, and this is probably a little bit more of a radical idea that I would love to see come to fruition, but probably won't, mm -hmm. publicly traded companies be required to pay their employees partially in stock, mm. where your CEO gets rich right. off the stock of the company that he or she leads for 5, 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. the majority of their compensation is company stock. Right. And so if I'm an executive for any publicly traded company, part of my compensation package is company stock. Right. But if I'm quote unquote rank and file, right. I'm not gonna get paid in company stock, I'm gonna get paid an hourly wage or a salary and told, you know, go yeah. by the, the wayside, don't come <laughs> don't talk worry, to us be about happy. an extra dollar. Right. But if I would have the ability to participate mm -hmm. in the appreciation of this value creation that my job does on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. then I benefit because I'm getting enriched financially. Right. You benefit because now I have a vested interest in this company doing well every single day I walk in here. Right. And I'm a little bit better off as a human person contributing to society and maybe I tithe more to my church or something. Who right. knows? Right. So I think, you know, it's an everybody wins scenario. Everybody except the person, the CEO, presumably, whose right. pocket those shares have to come out of to right. pay all of those workers. Real quick before we go to break, would it, I feel like, again, the reason why I pulled this story is because it, or I, you shared it with me and I was so impacted by it was because it was something that I felt could actually make a difference in terms of leveling up society and how things are structured socioeconomically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not through government intervention, so to speak. It's just the changing of how we say companies should be structured. Do you think this would actually have an impact on like economic inequality? I think it would have a tremendous impact on economic inequality. Um, basically for the reason I just outlined, because it would not go to your country club buddies. Right. It would flow to the $10 an hour workers right. 
who an extra dollar an hour makes a meaningful difference in their life. Right. So instead of having to take the bus to work 45 minutes every day, I can buy a car and get there in five. Right. So those kind of small changes, I think, make huge impacts in people's overall lives. Right. Where in order to implement that in a company that has 50,000 employees, maybe it costs your CEO two grand less than take home pay. Right. Well, the IRS was going to take 50% of it anyway. Right. So why not give it to your workers? Right. Let them reap the full benefit versus you taking a 50% cut on it because the IRS is America's favorite charity. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, if people could wrap their mind around the fact that you doing better doesn't mean I have to do worse. Right. It means we both do well. Right. If people could just grasp that simple concept, we right. would have a far better society. But the capitalistic society that we live in to the point that you teed up is so hardwired to believe that it's got to be either me or you. We can't both have right. success that, you know, it, we've gotten where we are. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, well, we want to remind people you can always catch past episodes of Manager Damn Money on Apple Podcasts. SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Of course, please leave us a review and give us a rating on any of those platforms that helps more people catch the show. If you have a topic you want us to cover on the show, send, it, send us your suggestion, info at managerdamnmoney.com. You can always catch us on social media. My handle is at MYDM with a one on the end. Malcolm, how about yours? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And of course, you can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back. Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where today's conversation at hand, we're discussing, is it time for a new kind of capitalism? Malcolm, we've been talking about this uh, Vox piece by Matthew Iglesias. Um, a second half of the piece actually asks uh, or discusses the economics of shareholder supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, the shareholder value error was pretty clearly brought about in an explosion in inequality in the United States. It succeeded, for starters, in greatly increasing the value of shares of stock in English-speaking countries, where Friedman's doctrine, Friedman being the person we referenced earlier in the show, uh, Friedman's, Friedman's doctrine has been most influential. Um, you can see this in the evolution of a ratio known as Tobin's Q, the value of all the shares of stock outstanding, divided by the book value of everything publicly, publicly traded companies own. Um, historically, this ratio was well below one, and it remains below one in Germany and Japan, where shareholder value does not reign supreme. But in the US, Britain, and Canada, the Q ratio has soared, meaning the financial value of corporate ownership has risen faster than the actual growth of the underlying enterprises, Malcolm, uh, leading to huge increases in wealth for the people who own the stock. Right. Um, since 80% of the value of stock 
market is owned by about 10% of the population and half of Americans own no stock at all, this, mean, this has a, been a huge triumph for the rich. Meanwhile, CEO pay has soared as executive compensation has been redesigned to incentivize shareholder gains and the CEOs have delivered. Gains for shareholders and greater inequality in pay has led to a generation of median compensation lagging far behind economic wide productivity um, with higher pay mostly captured by a relatively small number of people rather than being broadly shared across many people and people who work for the companies that are being profitable. So if I can stop you for two seconds, I don't disagree with the part about CEO pay and the median worker salary, mm-hmm. but using the Tobin ratio to, to justify it, I think is a little misleading. Okay. The reason I say that is because it's based on the productivity of the company right. itself mm-hmm. versus what assets the company owns and, and that sort of thing. Right. And it's comparing it to the World War II era where everything we did in this country was manufacturing, right. primarily at least. Manufacturing requires a lot of equipment. Stuff. It requires a lot of manpower. It right. requires a lot of tools and materials <laughs> right. and all that kind of stuff right. that I can walk into your factory and literally value it based on a dollar that's in a book. That's mm-hmm. where the term book value comes from. So right. if I've got a manual that says coffee mugs are valued at 30 cents, right. the book value of your coffee mug is 30 cents. Right. Well, you can't do that in today's post-Silicon Valley era right. where you can't walk into Facebook, touch anything other than a computer, and say this company is valued at X. Right. So the tech boom that started probably in the mid-50s, very early 60s, if anything, in Silicon Valley becoming a thing led to you no longer having tangible assets to value the companies on. Mm. So those kind of things that you want to use to determine ratios, they just don't exist anymore. Right. And People do business does, differently. And it doesn't necessarily apply to this current day and age the way we do business. Right. That's, that's a fair point. Um, the, the piece goes on to say investment, however, has soared. In fact, it's stacked. Oh, excuse me. It says investment, however, has not soared. In fact, it's stagnated. And a range of scholars believe shareholder capitalism is to blame. Uh, Dong Wok Lee, uh, Hyun Ha Shin, and Renee Zultz find that firms enjoying high Q uh, ratios now invest in share buybacks rather than reinvesting in their business. Mm-hmm. Um, the, heterodox, the heterodox economist William Lazenick of the University of Massachusetts puts the, th- the thesis very squarely, arguing that from the end of World War II until the late, 1970, late, late 1970s, a retain and reinvest approach to resource allocation prevailed at major U.S. corporations. But since the Reagan era, businesses have followed the downsize and distribute uh, regime of reducing cost and then distributing the freed up cash to financial interests, particularly shareholders. And that's kind of like the new, uh, I guess, over the last 30 or 40 years paradigm for capitalism where you, you know, maximize value and then rather than reinvest the money into the business, you're taking it out and extracting it at every point. Right. And I mean, that was people's biggest fear. And by people, I mean, critics of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed in December of last year. Uh That was everybody's biggest fear that this was going to be the last great push to distribute as much cash as possible to wealthy shareholders of publicly traded companies. Because as you said, 10% 10% of the country owns 80 some odd percent of all of the publicly traded stocks on the major exchanges right now. Those are insane numbers. So what that basically means is every dollar that I send out of my company into the hands of my shareholder has an astronomical effect on the other 20 people, 20% of people, maybe right, right. less than 20% of people who uh, actually live in this country, but don't own uh I mean, 20% of stocks right. that are there to be owned by 90% of people. Right. So that ratio is so out of balance Crazy. that people were saying, well, if you pass these tax cuts that basically are major business owner tax cuts dressed up as for the middle, middle class, class, then all you're going to do with the money that you bring in as tax cuts is distributed as share buybacks. And just for anybody listening who's not familiar, what a share buyback does is basically it pulls more uh, it it pulls some of the stock that's available out there in the market to trade out of the market to increase the price of the shares that are still left outstanding so Mm -hmm. if you have 500 shares of a company that are outstanding today you buy back a hundred of them out of the market 400 are left outstanding that automatically increases the the share price by 20 percent of all of the other company uh, all of the other shares that are out there and so what you basically did was just made my shares of your company way more valuable than they were the day before. Do you remember when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 
actually passed and they were talking all these companies were talking about we're gonna give a thousand dollar bonus to our employees at walmart <laughs> right we're gonna give two thousand dollar bonus to our employees at so-and-so bank we're gonna and it was a big deal everybody wanted right. to jump in front of the camera everybody and make felt it. good about it when's the last time you heard one of those <laughs> not since then they're still getting those tax breaks right when's the last time you heard somebody touting what they were going to give back to their employees because they got this break in right. the tax code so whoever it was who was fearful that that was going to be the thing that corporations did, mm -hmm. they were right. Right. We're seeing it happening. The stock market is booming. Right. And people aren't getting it in their hands as workers right. in any meaningful kind of way. Right. Interesting. Um, another uh, area that we looked at for um, this particular show, wondering whether or not it's time for a new ca kind of capitalism, uh, success of Uber and GoFundMe points to larger failures, says oh, an award-winning author. And this was a piece we pulled in uh, August 2018 from CNBC.com, a piece written by Megan Leonhart. Um, entrepreneurs like Mark Cuban and Dra uh, Damon John, I was going to say Draymond Green. <laughs> I don't know how you confuse the two I, of them. But I, I was, I, it was, you know, I don't know. It's the D, it's the one's D like five foot nine, the <laughs> other one's like nine foot five. Damon but, John, okay. Draymond Green, you can see why DJ, anyway. Nope. Um, Entrepreneurs like Mark Cuban and Damon John may extol the virtues of having a side hustle, but for many Americans, these side gigs are more than just a passion project. They're necessary second or third jobs, and that speaks to a wider problem. About 40% of Americans have some sort of side hustle and earn roughly $690 a month, according to a recent bank rate survey. Uh, at that time, the crowdfunding site GoFundMe has raised more than $5 billion since it launched in 2010. Um, Americans need to exam examine the article uh, reads the underlying reasons why so many people need to rely so heavily on these new money making ventures says Elisa Court who is the executive director of the economic hardship reporting project and author of recently re recently released book squeezed um, many of these companies have almost ben a benevolent reputation but they're actually taking advantage of quote unquote social problems that are being advertised as, advertised as, as pluses um, and I think what the point is being made is uh, whether it's Uber and having a side hustle, which, you know, they have those really nice flowery commercials where right. you can make extra money, um, or uh, what is it called, GoFundMe, you are essentially uh, outsourcing an opportunity where that opportunity might have come somewhere else a little bit more readily in the past. Yeah. Well, I mean, not only that, it, it creates a crutch on that side hustle right. that's very labor-intensive in sure. some cases instead of getting at the heart of the problem, which is that the average job just doesn't pay a livable wage. Right. So instead of creating these platforms for people to have a side hustle, maybe you create an opportunity where they get paid what they should have gotten paid in the first place. Right. Um, and so, you know, it kind of, again, throws the onus back on the corporations a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I, I just think, you know, realistically, that matters more. And I right. think about maybe the people who don't work for a large publicly traded company. Think about teachers, for example. Mm -hmm. In an example, a parallel they drew in the paper where they were talking about uh, teachers who drive Uber right. on the side. Right. So now my, my kid's teacher, who works 40 hours a week as a teacher or more, right. then goes out and drives Lyft or Uber for four hours every, every night right. to be able to sustain themselves because being a teacher doesn't. Right. Well, that's time that they should be grading papers, right. lesson planning, right. or sleeping so that they can put up with terrible kids <laughs> the next morning, right? right? So these are all things that take away from their ability to do the job that they went to school to do and want to be doing every day mm -hmm. just so that they can keep themselves alive. So now they're not all that effective at either one. Right. That's uh, – more uh, a more unsustainable unsustainable model to me right um and the article went on to say uh, middle class middle class life is now 30 percent more expensive than it was 20 years ago uh courts rights and families are dealing with the soaring cost of housing in college all while the average paycheck has the same purchasing power it did 40 years ago which is more to malcolm's point uh pay scale recently reported that real wages your take-home pay adjusted for inflation have not bounced back from the pre-recession levels of 2007, which is crazy. Um, even in cities where the job market is hot and wages are on the rise, like San Francisco, San Jose, Cal and California, residents' purchasing power is still down. Uh, and the final quote is, they prevent people from doing the work of their first profession, court says, adding that these jobs are often also poorly paid when all the variables are taken into account. For example, working a second job can cost side hustlers if they have to keep up their keep their kid in daycare, 
Um, similarly, drivers for Uber or Lyft and other ride sharing platforms will generally shell out more for maintenance on their cars. So it's really just kind of a cyclical thing where you're not able to really make any headway. You're just kind of like floating at the top, you know, barely making it from from time to time. Um, side, these side hustles and side hustle platforms, Malcolm, that allow the earning of extra income feels like a great thing. Like you can make extra money, blah, blah, blah. But you, as you mentioned, this really points to a failing of our economic system for right. like the regular people in the middle. Well, it also allows, uh, here's the skeptic in me, mm-hmm. but it also allows companies to suck a few more hours out of workers. Ah. So like Uber, for example, didn't exist 10 years ago. Right. Uh, 11 years ago, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it does. And what it allows a company Uber to do, for example, is extract four hours of labor out of you in exchange for $40 or whatever you end up netting. I don't know. Right. But now it allows me to extract a little bit more of productivity out of the workforce right. instead of returning back something meaningful to it right. in another way. Right. So I created a company to extract a few hours of labor pay you nominal nominally right. and then return the majority of that to my venture capital shareholders who invested in the company to begin with right. and I have given you absolutely nothing to make your life any better than it was the day before you signed up to drive at all and and here's an interesting example that I recently just had the experience of and was like oh my gosh my brain exploded um, Amazon's last mile delivery services have now I apparently at least in the Washington DC area been farmed out to normal people with like their regular cars I was at home somebody rang the doorbell I went downstairs it was a girl in a green vest and she gave me her uh, my box and was like here you go and she walked she walked back to her Honda Civic and I was like wait what (laughs) I was like wait what so are we now in like a, a moment where the culture is slowly eating away at the fabric of gainful employment that's a little bit of a problem of amazon's bigness <laughs> like right. they're too big for the u.s postal service who normally would cover that last mile right to the point they've got to go out and hire the lady who came to your house to drop off the package in her honda civic in her honda civic i think it was like a 2009 maybe so i will say though to amazon's credit they're piloting having franchisees right. drive vans for them to deliver packages in that last mile to ultimately take out the need to do that. So I think right. this is kind of just a stopgap for them. Right. However, it gets at just, I think that's more a testament to just the bigness of Amazon okay. than it is anything else. Right. But I do take your point that that person should be able to afford their lifestyle based on the one nine to five that right. they have, presumably this not being it. Right. Um, rather than having to go find other things to do to trade hours for dollars. Right. Um, last question before we close this close this show. Um, what are some solutions to rebalancing the focus our economy puts on profits for companies versus shareholders? Um, do you think that will ever be possible to like rebalance that considering where we are? Like we're so far on one end, end of the capitalism spectrum. Do you think like the Elizabeth Warren plan, we could ever kind of inch it back towards some kind of Equal, equal equality i think it's going to be a, a gumbo of a lot of different things being thrown in the pot so right. the elizabeth warrens who are elected officials right elizabeth warren happens to be also a very influential uh, uh professor at harvard she has uh her own army of followers who are like gung-ho teaching her her messages across the country right and so those people eventually are going to you know quote unquote grow up into positions in elected office the same way she did and spread her tutelage. (laughs) So you've got that kind of compound effect. Right. But then you've also got people like, I can't remember exactly the family, but there's a very wealthy family who, if I said the name of it, you would be like, oh my God, yeah, they own everything. Uh Um, Where one of their heirs, their youngest heir, graduated from college, found out how her family makes their money, how they're able to sustain themselves was grossed out by the fact that like her family doesn't do anything for a living. Oh wow. And is giving away money. Oh wow. Like literally giving away all of the money that she knows that she has. Wow. So you have people like that also. I'm sure those are fewer and further in between. <laughs> but I think the combination of all of those things from one end to the other being thrown together at the same point in time mm-hmm. creates some activity to right. where you're not going to have a choice as the head of 
a major corporation. You either get right or get left. Right. And as we saw with the whole Nike thing that happened, you know, I don't know how many weeks ago now, mm -hmm. but people want to see you do the right thing and right. they are willing to vote with their dollars. Indeed, indeed. Well, on that note, uh, we'll close the show by reminding you can always catch past episodes of Manage Your Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. And please, please, please leave us a review and a rating on any of those platforms that helps more people catch our show. If you have a question for Malcolm that you want him to answer or a show topic you want us to cover, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, uh, if you want to catch us on social media, you can catch me on Instagram and Twitter at MYDM1. Malcolm, what's your handle? At Malcolm on Money. And of course, uh, you can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We'd like to thank our uh, studio here at Montgomery Community Media for yet another great show. Until next time, be good with your money. Peace. Peace.